We'll ask Brother Kevin to come at this time and bring the message. Good morning. So I was talking to my father-in-law yesterday about uh, sermon preparation, and it's really amazing how God gives you ideas for sermons. I got this idea about a month ago uh, on this message today, and I guess what I want to convey to you is that these are not my words today. This is God's word for you today, so I pray it's a blessing. Um, as I was reading my devotional this morning, I was reading John chapter 13. For those of you who are, who are familiar with that passage, it's where Jesus washes his disciples' feet. And it just struck me this morning that not only did he wash the feet of the 11 disciples who were faithful to him, but he washed the feet of his betrayer. Isn't that amazing? So my next sermon, Ron, is going to be on Judas. I'm looking forward to bringing God's word to you on that. So today, the title of our message is, How Did We Get Here? And our scripture reading is found in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 28. A very uh, simple and small verse. Proverbs 22, 28. I first heard this verse when I was in college. I attended a... Uh, non-denominational church in college called Williamsburg Community Chapel, and their pastor used to give these uh, Friday morning uh, breakfast uh, Bible studies for business people at a hotel. And I tell you, I loved going to these breakfasts because you, I was just hungry for the word. And uh, he gave a message on this verse, and it, it hit me, I'll tell you. And so God brought this to my heart, Proverbs 22, 28 simply says this, remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are grateful to be in a place today where we can hear from you. I pray, God, you would um, take away distractions, take away things that might steal the word from us, God, and and just give us clarity of thought. Help us to receive what you have for us today. Lord, help me to preach faithfully your word. Thank you, Lord, for the believers that are here. Thank you for the unbelievers that are here. God, may they each get something from today's message, and may they each grow closer to you. Uh, we just commit these next few minutes to you. I pray you would use them for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So how did we get here? You may have heard that question recently if you've been watching the news or reading the newspaper. We've got a war going on, and, and people are asking, how did we get here? How did we get to this point of conflict? And what they're really asking is, you know, what events have taken place years ago that led us to this point? Well, I think that same question, how did we get here, can be asked of our culture today in America. You know, what was once considered a Christian nation can no longer make that claim. Instead, we're living in a time where truth does not exist, and many of the ancient boundary stones have been removed. You know, in the short span of 50 years, we went from leave it to beaver to the Kardashians. From Andy Griffith to reality TV. Folks, this has happened in a very short period of time. In his word, God warned his people about removing the ancient landmarks. And this verse in Proverbs, I think, provides great insight into what has gone wrong in our society today. So just as a little bit of a background, you know, in ancient Israel, land ownership was you know, one of the most important possessions that a family could have. This land that they owned would be passed down from generation to generation and would be part of your family for hundreds of years. And the way they determined where one person's land ended and another person's began 
is they used what were called boundary stones. And they were basically these markers that were set into the ground and they were dug down deep and they basically marked this is where the Flynn property ends and then this is where the Ross property begins, right? And these ancient boundary stones were set and they were not to be moved. If you were walking along the way and you saw this stone, you understood clearly that it meant the change of ownership from one property to another. If you were to move this boundary stone, it would be basically like you were stealing someone else's property. Well, who established these ancient boundaries? You know, this verse in Proverbs says that they were established by the ancient fathers, which is technically correct. Men put these boundary stones in place. But the real answer is they were set by God. You see, when you look back in the Old Testament and you read the book of Joshua, you learn about what happened when the people of Israel came in and they conquered the land of Canaan that God had given to them. They drove out the enemies. But then there was a problem, how to divide up the land. And so God, in his wisdom, provided boundaries for each of the 12 tribes. And he specifically laid out where that boundary would be so that each tribe had their own separate possession. You know, I believe this verse has not only physical uh, applications, but it has spiritual applications for us as Christians today. You know, we don't use boundary stones anymore. Now we have fences and different ways to mark property. But we have spiritual landmarks that have been removed and that have really caused the decline in our society. Now, there are many to be sure that we can think on. Today, I just want to focus on three landmarks or boundary stones that have that have been moved in the past 50 years and the impact they've had on our society. So the first boundary stone that I want to focus on is education. Now, I work in education, so I feel I've got a little bit of skin in the game on this one. You know, education is one of the pillars of any great society. If you study ancient Rome, ancient Greece, the emphasis they placed on teaching the next generation was significant. And if you think about it, what we choose to teach our kids says a lot about us and what we believe and what our values are. Well, God took the education of children very seriously. And if you read his word, if you look in the book of Deuteronomy, he gave a command to the people of Israel. Deuteronomy 11 this is Moses telling the people, he says, Therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Notice God did not say, you shall speak of my word on Sundays for about an hour, and then the rest of the week is on your own. He commanded the people to teach his word wherever they were. If they were sitting in the house watching TV, if they were walking along the path, or today we'd say driving in a car, heading somewhere, if they were laying down to go to sleep, if they were waking up in the morning, whatever part of the day or life they were in, they were to be teaching them God's word and God's ways. You know, if you've ever seen the movie The Nativity Story, there's a beautiful scene that really captures this about how the Jewish people took this so, so much to heart. There's a scene where Mary is working at an older woman's house, and this older woman has a group of young children in front of her, and she's teaching them the story of Elijah. And when Elijah heard God's voice, right? The still, small whisper. And as she's telling this story, the kids are getting more excited and more excited until they say, you know, his voice came in a still, small whisper. And, and right at that point, you know, Mary reveals these like special treats for the kids. Well, this was, they were following the command in Deuteronomy 11 
to teach the children the ways of the Lord. If you study the history of America, I know Pastor is very up on that, and many of you are, you may be surprised to learn that most our education system in America has a Christian foundation. You know, Harvard, the very first university, was started by Puritans to advance the gospel. Princeton, Yale, Oxford, Cambridge, all these institutions of higher learning were started by Christians to advance the gospel. Yet now these schools teach the exact opposite of their foundation. They teach a a pluralistic worldview where God is a figment of your imagination, basically. So how did we get to this point in education, a Christian foundation to now being completely secular? Well, there have been some landmark cases in the Supreme Court that have impacted this, and there's just one I'm going to talk about that took place in 1962. The Supreme Court ruled that prayer in public schools was now illegal, that it violated the Establishment Clause of the Constitution, basically that the government cannot establish any certain religion. But I did some digging into this case because it's very interesting. Basically, there was uh, schools in, in New Hyde Park, New York, that their, uh, the way they started their day was that the principal said that this prayer was to be said aloud in each classroom. And listen to this prayer. Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee, and we beg thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. No student was forced to say this prayer. In fact, if they were uncomfortable, they could leave the classroom. But it didn't matter. The high court struck it down and said, we don't want God's name mentioned in our classroom. I wouldn't even call that a Christian prayer, really. That's just basically a prayer saying, God, we acknowledge that you are there, we depend on you, and we ask your blessings upon our parents, our teachers, and our children. But yet that was, that was eliminated. The landmark was removed. So what's been the result of removing prayer and God from public education? Basically, it's been secularized and humanized to the nth power. Instead of acknowledging our dependence on God each day, we're now saying, well, we have the answers. Trust in us, right? Our human thinking, our human reason is going to win the day. You know, the interesting thing about our education system today, and like I said, I'm a part of it, many in our congregation are, is that you're really free to discuss any other faith out there. You want to bring in some Eastern religion, some Buddhism, some different things, that's accepted. You want to talk about Islam, you want to talk about other faiths, they welcome it. Even Wicca, I had a discussion with a group of teachers around Christmas about Wiccan traditions and how we should introduce them to our children. But yet, Christianity, God's Word, the Bible, excluded completely. So as a Christian working in public schools, it can be very challenging. And I would ask that you would just pray for our school teachers, our principals, those who uphold God's word, that they would have wisdom as they interact with teachers and parents to be a godly example to them. So what's the answer? You know, as people of faith, we are still called to obey Deuteronomy 11. God's commandment to teach our children his ways. You know, when we're sitting at, I already talked about that, but parents, here's, here's you know, we should talk about God, but, but our lives should reflect our beliefs. So I believe that our children should see us reading the word of God. They should see us doing that. They should see us studying our Bibles. They should see us praying. 
They should see us serving in the local church, and they should be invited along to serve alongside of us. I'm so proud of my girls and, me, and, and everyone here, I'll be very honest, but you know, when we were going to the nursing home at Harvester, Harvester Place, my girls would come along. And, and they began to get to know the residents by name, and the residents were so appreciative. I think they enjoyed seeing them more than they did me, I'll be very honest with you. They, they you know, oh, beautiful girl, beautiful, and me, they were kind of like, you know, keep moving. I get that, I get that. But they should, they, our, our children should see us serving. And I believe nothing does more damage on the flip side to a young person than to see an adult who claims to be a follower of Christ, who wants to hold high the banner of Christian thought and, you know, will be the first one shouting hallelujah, but yet their lives do not reflect how God wants us to live. Children see right through that hypocrisy, folks. They see right through it, and that affects them. We need to be true to our beliefs. Make your family a place where talking about faith is just as common as talking about sports and politics and other things. Obey God's command in Deuteronomy 11, folks. You know, as a side note, and I, and I like I said, I'm very proud of the families here. I, I thought of uh, Jonathan Reed. And um, he had one of his daughters memorize the catechism. And, and she came up here and recited that before the church. What a powerful example Amen. of taking God's word seriously. Amen. So education is the first landmark that's been moved. The second one, the boundary stone that has been moved in our marriage, in, in our in our society is marriage. Now, despite what you may have heard in the news, marriage is not a man-made institution. It was created by God. All the way back in Genesis chapter 2, folks, before the fall of man, God created marriage. Listen to Genesis 2, verse 24. It says, Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This is God's prescription for marriage. Amen. It's called leaving and cleaving. Leaving behind our old lives and our dependence on our parents and cleaving together and now being dependent on each other. And as a side note, I'm just going to throw this out there. Some of you need to work on that leaving part. You need to cut the apron strings. And, and, and what I mean by that is you need to be more dependent on your spouse and, and, and who God has brought you together than to be running to mommy and daddy all the time when you have a problem. Okay? I'm just going to say it like that. Marriage was meant to last forever. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. Mark 10, 19. So marriage was instituted by God, and it was meant to be one man and one woman for life. I did a little research. In the 1950s, less than 20% of marriages ended in divorce. And another way to say that is that 80% of all marriages lasted. Well, just 50 years later, you guys know the statistics, right? Over 50% of marriages now end in divorce. And the average marriage today lasts only eight years. It was hard to read, but I did a little more digging into statistics. It said every 42 seconds in America, a divorce takes place. So by the time this message is over, there'll be like 40 divorces in our country. But what's the number one reason why marriage is split up. What is the number one reason that was cited? And it was simply this, lack of commitment. Lack of commitment. If we think back to our wedding vows, that special moment where we pledge to each other our love, I, Kevin, take you, Amanda, to be 
my wife, to have you, to hold you, to honor you, to treasure you, to be at your side in sorrow and in joy, in good times and in bad, to love and cherish you always for all the days of my life. This is the commitment we make to each other. This vow is spoken before people and it's spoken before God. And when we break this vow, it does damage, right? Now, I, I'm not saying this to bring shame on anybody. If you've gone through a divorce, I know many who have, and, you know, that's not my point in sharing this. But it's just to say, God takes our commitments seriously. When we stand before him and we stand before others and we pledge to be committed to one another, that means something. And in Ecclesiastes, it said, it's better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. So think about your vows. Think about that commitment. Do not rush into a commitment like marriage. Make sure that it is God's plan for you, God honoring for you. Young people, pray before you take that step of marriage. Ask for God's guidance. Make sure it's with someone who's of equal faith. It says be equally yoked together. It's a big step. Because God's plan is for you to be married for life through good times and in bad. In James it says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And as followers of Christ, that's what we're called to be. Now I'm just going to just revisit that. If, if you have been through a divorce, that's not the unpardonable sin. God forgives us and cleanses us of all those things. And whatever relationship you're in now, be committed to 100%. That's what I would say about that. So education, the landmark's been moved. Marriage, the landmark's been moved. And the third one I'm going to tackle today is gender. Gender. There's a revolution taking place in our country and around the world. We all see it. We all see it. We were just talking about it yesterday in our family gathering. It's the transgender revolution. I want to just say at the start, I know there are people who struggle with their identity. I understand that. And, and I believe our church has compassion for them. And that I want them to know at the front, God still loves you. He wants to be in a relationship with you through his son. But I think what we're experiencing in our culture today is not a struggle with our identity. It's an effort to completely reshape who we are as human beings. It's foundational. For those of us who believe this is the word of God, again, we don't have to get very far to hear God's voice on this topic of gender, do we? Genesis chapter 1. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Who knows the next part? Male and female, he created them. Thank you, Mavis. So we learn two very important things from this verse. First, we were created in God's image. Humans are the only ones who can make this claim. Animals were not created in God's image. Plants were not created in God's image, only us. People alone bear the image of our creator. And what that means is that we were meant to live forever. We were given eternity, right? We were given a soul. We have the image, the stamp of our creator upon us. But we learned something else from this verse. We were created male and female. And you know, folks, the reason why we're male and female is because God is very complex. I know we refer to him as he and our father. But do you know that he encompasses all the characteristics of both a male and a female? Did you know that? It's amazing. When Jesus was Approaching Jerusalem, he knew it was close to be his final days, his final march into the city. He looked upon the city. It's on a hill. It's beautiful. And he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I desired 
to gather you as a mother gathers its chicks. But you would not have me. You would not have me. He didn't say like a father gathers his children. He said like a mother gathers his chicks. That nurturing, that compassion. Folks, God himself encompasses all the beautiful characteristics of both men and women together. So for God to fully express himself, he had to create two types. Two types. Equal, but different. So key. So foundational. You know, our gender is really the most foundational part of who we are. When a baby is conceived in the mother's womb, at the moment of conception, gender is there. It's made up of two chromosomes. A woman is an XX and a man is an XY. And folks, guess what? You can't change your chromosomes. It's not possible. As much as you might want to think you can, you can't. You know, the past two years, woo, we've heard a lot of crazy stuff from our media, but one that we've heard over and over and over is follow the science. There it is. Follow the science. Follow the science. The science is clear. Male and female. It's clear. It's undisputable. I mean, think about this. I was just trying to think about this. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, if you would have walked into, Sam, if you would have walked into the barber shop and said, you know, my name is Samantha, they would have locked you up, brother. I mean, seriously. <laughs> you would have been in a mental institution. You said, you're crazy. But now we're being told that not only do we have to acknowledge that, we have to support it. It's causing chaos in our society. It really is. Young people, it's, the confusion is there. If we can't rely on the most basic foundation of who we are, how can anything else be valid? See, and this is Satan's attempt to rock the foundations. If he can move these ancient landmarks, then nothing else is valid. Nothing else is true. Do you see that, guys? It's foundational. Boys participating in girls' sports, girls using boys' bathrooms. It, it's chaos. And, you know, there's even a new trend that I'm reading about, and it's called non-binary. You're neither a boy or a girl. You know, it just goes on and on. The attack, here's my point, and please hear me. The attack on gender is an attack on God himself, Okay. It's not an attack on American values. I'm all for American values. It's an attack on God himself. Genesis 1, 24. He created them male and female. Did God make a mistake? No. He knew exactly who you were meant to be. But the Bible predicts that this will happen. That's the interesting thing, folks. We can throw up our hands and say, I can't believe all this is happening. The Bible spells it out. Romans chapter 1, it tells us exactly what's going to happen in the last days. Where's my Romans chapter 1? It says this, 124, Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. But listen to this next verse. They exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. And that's what's happening today, folks. That's what's happening. We are suppressing the truth. Deep inside, every person has the truth. It's deep in there. But what we do is we suppress it, we bury it, and we worship the 
creature rather than the creator. So I thought of this analogy. I don't know if it's a good one. But imagine you went to the Art Institute of Chicago and you're looking at a beautiful painting. Maybe it's a Van Gogh, maybe it's a Picasso. And you are just enamored with this painting. Oh, this is the most beautiful painting I have ever seen. I just adore this painting. It is just all the colors. It is just beautiful. And then someone comes along and says, well, you know, would you like to meet the artist? The artist? Are you kidding me? That bum? I don't want anything to do with that guy. But this painting, oh, I love the painting. You see what's happening? We worship the creation and we dismiss the creator. Foolishness. Foolishness. If we love the creation, then we should look to the creator and bless the creator and say, thank you, God, for your creation. But that's what's happening, and that's what's happening in our world today, and it will continue happening until the return of Christ. As Pastor has been preaching, our world is not going to get better. I'm not trying to be a doom and gloom, but that is the trajectory we are on. That is the trajectory we are on. So that's been another boundary stone that is being moved right now, is that of gender. Education, marriage, gender, three foundational things in our society that have been moved the past 50 years. So how do we respond? What do we do? Do we yell at the TV? Do we act crazy like I do? My wife thinks I'm, you know, she knows whenever I'm watching the news because I'm yelling at the TV and kicking the dog and doing all sorts of stuff. Ugh. How do we respond to a culture that's rejected God and his ways? Well, the Bible tells us. Matthew 7, 24 through 27, and it's the second congregational we sing today. Here's what those verses say. Jesus speaking. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. But everyone that hears these words of mine and does not do them shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Folks, that rock is Jesus Christ. That is the foundation we need to build our lives upon. And that is a foundation, that is an ancient landmark that will never be removed. And when the storms of life come, the rains come, the wind blows, we can stand strong. Our house will stand. But yet the sand, this is the world's philosophy. Money, pleasure, popularity, success, all the things that the world is chasing, right? They all come crashing down when the storms of life come against it. And I think it's interesting. Scripture says, great is that fall. Now, God gave me an analogy just this morning. I love it. We had a very large thunderstorm come through our area last night. I don't know if you all did. And the wind, the wind was very strong. And when I woke up this morning, I looked in our backyard, and our swing set had come crashing down. It had toppled over. Well, it was an older swing set. I know, Marissa, it was scary. It was an older swing set. It, it had some rotting wood. It was on sand. And guess what? When the winds of life came, it didn't tip over slowly. It came crashing down. And basically, it's smashed in pieces now. It's done. That's a picture of a life that's built on anything else but Jesus Christ. Anything else but Jesus Christ. Amen. One day will come and your life will come crashing down. Great will be the fall. 
But whoever hears these words of mine and does them, he will be a wise man who built his house upon a rock. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, invite him into your life today. Confess your sins to him. Tell him you want him to be the Lord of your life. Jesus promised that all who receive him to those who believe in his name, he gives the power to become sons and daughters of God. Amen. All right, Pastor. Would you please stand and bow your heads, please? You've heard the word of God today. Now, you've been given the word of God. How does it apply? Number one, if you're here without Christ, you've never trusted Christ. He offers you an invitation. And it comes from the cross. And his son, the perfect son of God, died and shed his blood to pay for your sin debt. Nothing he owed, he paid everything we owe. And when he said it is finished, he gave his life. He gave it up for you. And then was placed in the grave three days, but you can't keep God in the grave. Three days later he arose. And is alive today at the right hand of the Father. And dear friend, today, if you're lost without Christ, you've never accepted him as Savior and Lord. And as you heard today that you repent of your sin, turn from your sin, and turn to Christ. He says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall and can be saved. Maybe you're here and you're saved today and you know Christ. Are you living for God? At home, are you living for God? If not, you need to start. Get right with God and start living for Him. Yes, the things are crumbling, as you heard Brother Kevin say. And we're standing on the rock of ages, those of us who are saved. And it might shake a little bit, but the rock of ages won't move. Would you trust Christ today? Father, thank you for your word from your man today. Lord, for all of us, especially for those who are lost without Jesus Christ. Father, they might be wondering in their mind, I've never seen Jesus, but they've seen the lives changed by Jesus. I pray today that the Holy Spirit would have liberty to move on those hearts that are without Christ and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I can't save myself, and I will accept Christ as my Savior and Lord. For those who are naming the name of Christ, if they've never been baptized, the first thing that they should do after they have been uh, coming to the faith, they should be baptized and identify with Christ and then disciple. And Father, Lord, we pray for that person today. And then, Father, we pray for the people here today and those listening at home. Lord, your word goes way past the congregation into the homes of people who are watching. And they've been presented that today. And, Lord, now I pray they would decide in their lives what they want. Do they want a life in Christ for salvation? Or do they want a life in Christ? They've been saved, and now they want to follow, and they want to do what you want them to do. I pray for them today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What page, Evelyn? Page 488. Page 488. If God spoke to your heart, Kevin's up here, and I'm up here. We'd be glad to pray for you. But today, now is the day of salvation. Now is accepted time. Just as you are. Just as I am with. How about it, friend? Whatever your age, young person, old person, 
Christ paid the price. Nothing you can do can bring forgiveness of sins because Christ did it for you at the cross. Christ paid the price. Would you accept him by faith? You don't have to say a prayer. You just need to accept him now. You say, Pastor, I can't see him. Jesus said himself after he rose again. Thomas grabbed him. He said, my Lord and my God. But Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and believe. That's you, my friend. That's you, dear friend. Would you give your life to Christ? As God deals with your heart. Maybe you're here and you're saved. You need to get right with God. Live for Christ. Just as you are. My body's praying. You got many conflicts. You got many doubts. Jesus said, I am the way. If you're going the wrong way, he's the way. If you've been told a lie, he says he's the truth. If your life has been fulfilled, you know why? Because you don't have Christ in your Savior. One more verse. This is your verse. One more verse. 